This is the Story Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg, and this is episode 61. I'm totally thrilled to share my conversation with Diana Foe. We actually spoke back in April when things were really picking up when it comes to coronavirus. And I suppose that depends on where you live, but at least where I live in the United States, And now it's June 2020 as I release this episode. And in the interim, I've chatted with Diana and she's passed on some insights that add context to this time we're finding ourselves in. She said, our punk values still flourish even as times become even more trying. And we must always support black and other marginalized communities in their fight towards liberation. And I just thought that was a beautiful way to put it. She also talked about how this nation's uprising aligning with Black Lives Matter is so, so heartening, and I totally agree. As we come to podcast episodes like this, I think a lot of us are looking for something relevant, but also imaginative and buoyant. And this conversation definitely hits both of those notes. That's how I felt as I interviewed Diana, and she has so much insight from all her experience. So I wanna jump right in. I do have a quick confession for those of you who are watching the video version, and that's that I accidentally pinned Diana's video. So I messed up. As you already know from past episodes, I'm on the screen like 5% of the time anyway. It's all about Diana, so just didn't want you to be surprised by that. And without further ado, here we go, jumping right in with part one of two. Diana M. Pho, also known as Aileen the Peacemaker, is a queer Vietnamese-American independent scholar, playwright, and three-time Hugo Award-nominated book editor. Diana's academic work includes critical analysis of the role of race in fashion, performance, and the media, in addition to pieces focusing on fan studies and fan communities. She also runs Beyond Victoriana, an award-winning U.S.-based blog on multicultural steampunk and the oldest existing blog on this topic. For several years, she has traveled the country as a professional convention speaker about social justice issues and fandom. Her academic articles about steampunk can be found in the Journal of Neo-Victorian Studies, Fashion Talks, Undressing the Power of Style, Steaming into a Victorian Future, Overland Magazine, and Like Clockwork edited by professors Brian Croxell and Rachel Bowser. She has also written multiple introductions and articles on the subject, including Steampunk World, edited by Sarah Hans, and the Steampunk User's Manual by Jeff Vandermeer and Desirina Voskovich. Diana has been interviewed about fandom for many media outlets, including BBC America, the Travel Channel, HGTV, CBS's Inside Edition, MSN.com, and The Science Channel. Diana currently lives and works in New York City. You can learn more about her academic and editorial work at dianamfo.com and follow her on Twitter at Writer Syndrome. Diana, it is so wonderful to have you on the Story Punks podcast today. Yeah, it's really great to have, um, to be here too. And I'm just really excited to really dive deep into steampunk. It's been a while since I've had a conversation like this. So. <laughs> I know. We've seen a lot of different ebbs and flows with the trend and everything. I don't even know if we can call it a trend, but that's exactly what I want to talk about is how things are going when it comes to you know the movement at large. But I want to start with definitions. This is where I always start the interviews because it's fun to see how different people define terms like steampunk. And this is such a big thing on your site beyond Victoriana. How do you go about defining it there and, and just in general? So it's, it's really fascinating. When I first started being active in the steampunk community about 10 years ago, there, there is this on again, off again debate about particularly the punk in steampunk, uh, you know, and whether that punk involves a certain aesthetic, a certain ideology, a certain ethos. That has always been up for debate. And at the time, uh, there was a segment of the population who said, no, like punk 
does not belong in steampunk for various reasons. And, you know, some people said, that, oh, punk is a political term and they don't think steampunk is political or they thought that punk is just a reference to a subcultural time period. They're like, this isn't the late 70s, early 80s, however long punk you think actually lived. So it's not relevant to this community. Um and there's, you know, there's that joke that Jess Nevins once said that punk, uh, steampunk was when goths discover brown. So that is also up for debate. I've always loved that. It's playful. Yeah, exactly. It's very, it's very playful. And, and I think people tend to conflate that playfulness with like, oh, we can't ever be serious because we're just having fun. Because once you make things serious, then it stops being enjoyable. Or if you start to question uh, some of the elements that, you know, steampunk uh, source material talks about, then you're not having fun. Then, then you're just being too serious. And why are you here? <laughs> and, um, you know, and, I, and of course, there are people who said that, you know, the punk and steampunk doesn't really fit in because they were just tired of punk being co-opted for commercial or corporate reasons. And they thought that steampunk was just this aesthetic that's being, you know, very commercialized, um, that's being, you know, used in ways that were actually against any anti-establishment meaning. So they, you know, so it wasn't appropriate. So there's many different reasons why people had this argument. In the present moment, the, that debate has subsided a bit, partly because people respected each other's differences and let steampunks do what they want, including being political. Um, except, like, the one thing I think we all agreed upon in the community is that you don't belong in steampunk if you're a fascist or you're a bigot. <laughs> that is what we agreed upon in 2016, pretty strongly. <laughs> and so, you know, no neo Nazis, no racists, all of you guys don't belong. That isn't cool. And I'm glad at least that thing was decided upon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I still think there needs to be, uh, you know, safety and openness for everyone to be involved. So I love that you said that. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that's, you know, all the historical, I guess, context uh, based on my experience in the community. Um, so... Uh, the shorter answer is that, yes, for me, uh, steampunk does have ideological connotations, um, but also I understand that steampunks have a range of political ideologies. Many in the community are some form of leftist or anarchist, actually, which is interesting because when you see like mainstream geek culture, like make fun of steampunks, they think that they're, oh, they're just people who are reactionary conservatives, which is totally the opposite of the truth. Um, you know, and, and I personally also identify as, as being anti-racist, progressive, and an interse intersectional feminist, with, which is something that I think a lot of people that um, I am still connected to in the steampunk community also identify as. I love getting your pulse on this or your reading of the pulse of the community because you have been so involved in so many things. And I know a lot of people listening to this, they already know you, they already know what you've been working on but how did you fall in love with steampunk to start uh so how did i personally fall in love with steampunk is really interesting because um uh, i was always interested in, in you know 19th century literature i was an english russian double major in undergrad um you know i was really obsessed with the brontes <laughs> nice. and with like the original goth gothic culture um, growing up as well and, you know, did the whole thing of like tea parties and dressing up and pretending I was like running across the moors or whatever, <laughs> whatever you do when you're an angsty teenager, right? Uh, totally. So, uh, when I first heard about steampunk, however, my, it was my wife who introduced it to me and she explained it to me as as this like she and her friends who are you know larpers and cosplayers um they first got into it because someone created a steampunk themed um rpg campaign and they all got super involved in it and they then they started dressing up as their characters and they started going to conventions uh so how she explained to me was that oh steampunk is when you dress up 
in science fictional and fantasy inspired Victorian wear, you go to conventions and people take pictures of you. <laughs> so that is how I first got introduced to like the concept of steampunk, even though I know it's so much more than that. And it also really speaks to how people absorb uh, you know, the community and define that on so many different levels that it's not just literature, but there's a visual culture attached. There's a social connotation with it. Uh, it was understood as a form of play and not just a form of like passive entertainment. Uh, it was, you know, defined as something as being very individualized and customizable. And you didn't have to adhere to some sort of larger standard of rules in order to be uh, define yourself as being a steampunk or participate in the community. So all those things I took with me with that explanation. And I was like, oh, that's really great. Um, so, uh, you know, and I was like, well, I would like to like do this cosplay convention thing. And, you know, one of the things that I also like had a concern about was that you know, admittedly, all of her friends are white. And and I didn't feel comfortable because they all had characters who were basically really over-the-top tropes of 19th century pulp fiction characters. And I was like, well, like, if you took someone, you know, like myself and looked at what kind of 19th century, like, you know, tropes there are, it's really just, like, damaging and hurtful stereotypes. Um, You know, and I would rather not play like a stereotype that I felt super uncomfortable being, especially when it still applied to my everyday life. Uh, And so that led to the creation of my steampunk character, Aileen the Peacemaker. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about how you developed Aileen the Peacemaker. And especially you use this phrase called the endowed memories of objects when it comes to steampunk, which I love that term. And I immediately thought of your costuming, your cosplay. And will you just take us through how you decided what you were going to dress like when you reflected this character that you'd created? Uh, Yes, um, certainly. When I was thinking about Alien the Peacemaker, first of all, it started off as a joke. I was joking around with my wife. um, I was like, well, if I were to play a steampunk character, I would be a Tonkinese Buddhist assassin who shoots French imperialists in the face. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And yeah, and it it turned out to be a pretty good idea. Uh, And when I was uh, thinking about uh, why I wanted to have that specific character, um, no, I was. I remember talking with someone, uh, you know, about being involved in the community and what it, what it meant to create a character. And I, I, I told them. I said that I don't feel exactly comfortable, you know, being involved at the same level as you because I just have concerns about colonialism. Uh, and this person, you know, immediately replied like, "Oh, you don't have to worry about that. That is not an issue at all. Because at least, like, for example, for 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 us, like, we just pretend that the United States never left the British Empire. It's still the colonies, and then we're all just part of the colonies." And I'm like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> that is not what I meant." <laughs> um, you know, and and that's what you know. I was worried about, I was just worried about how the concept of steampunk and the people involved were just looking for excuses to romanticize history and kind of erase and scrub away, you know, the elements, you know, that were, that were real and hurtful and oppressive uh, because they felt like, you know, it had no place. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and I think that is really where the, punk of steampunk comes in it's anti-establishment if you do question authority if you do bring up you know the dark parts and say like yes this is what you know steampunk is too you have to address it you can't just ignore it because to ignore it means to erase it and that is actually worse you know um than what you think about when you know you go off and you have your your fun and not acknowledge why you think it's fun as opposed to what other people think of as being painful. Um, and so uh, when I created um, In the Peacemaker, 
I, I, I had, I have like a whole second other wardrobe of, of her <laughs> outfits, by the way. Like, I, this is, <laughs> which is like, it, 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 that's what happens when you're a cosplayer. You just keep making outfits. That's what I love. See, I haven't gone there. I have not been a cosplayer, even though I love steampunk. I just, it is such an investment of time. And I love that you have a separate wardrobe. I think that's what it would take. But don't let me interrupt you. Keep going. Yeah. I mean, you know, but it, 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 you always have to start somewhere. Like, you you know, it's fine um, if you feel like you're, you just need to build something up. And I think that's also what makes being a volunteer community so flexible, because especially as time went on, people became less judgmental about being historically accurate, like having a certain look, like, you know, having, you know, and being more open to like different like socio socioeconomic you know, abilities to create outfits. Um, and a lot of my stuff is basically DIY stuff out of junk. You know, the actual peacemaker itself is just a, you know, a revamped caulking gun that I literally like spray painted and glued stuff on. Nice. Um, I could actually, it's, it's right behind me. I don't know. Like my, um, you know, we need to see that please. <laughs> yeah, sure. See if I don't trip over all of my own wires. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the peacemaker. Nice. It's like you know, it's it's over. It's like ten years old now, but you know, it still has like firing capabilities. I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know, it has a. As you can tell, it has a nice place on the bookshelf, like. And the top shelf of all of like my other geeky steampunky stuff. <laughs> so cool. Is there anything else you want to show us from that shelf? Yeah. It's okay yeah. If not, but let's see where my other guns are. Yes. So this is also like another vamped weapon. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting cause it's like, this actually was, um, given to me by my friend Jamie Go, who is also, you know, part, you know, was part of the steampunk community, is part of the steampunk community, is an editor. We co-wrote academic articles together and we, and we just met through this community. Um, you know? And so like she gave me uh, the, the dragon base and I, you know, and she like attached it to a handle. I'm like, here, and she's like, here you go. that's all I know how to do. And I basically did everything else. <laughs> I mean, to me, it look it has that real looking quality. I love it. Right, and and I think that's also what's fascinating because there's so many people in the community that have different skill sets, um, and you know, and they all just bring in their own style to like how they do it. Whether they're a maker or a cosplayer, um, someone who just has never done any sort of crafting before, but realize, oh, now I can do this thing and it's really cool. Um, you know, or someone who's just in, into like other things, like the, you know, fiber arts is actually pretty huge, just as much as it is like making things out of metal uh, and whatnot. And I think it's really fascinating to think about us now. And there was this whole, um, there was a commentary, uh, you know, I kept hearing about, you know, are we prepared for like a post-apocalyptic world? Like, what would you need? And, uh, you know, and a woman pointed out, well, you need someone who can sew and knit and bake and all this stuff. You can't just go running around the woods, hunting everything and wearing skins and, you know, becoming like the Mad Max you know, of the forest or whatever. And that person was right. Like, you know, now what do we see? You see people like making masks, you see people baking bread, you, you know, we see all the stuff that is actually helpful as opposed to like creating your militia out in the middle of nowhere and, and you know, and all living in your bunker, you know? <laughs> Completely. Oh, I love that parallel with what's going on. It's really cool to see how you've developed. Now, do you want me to also mention, does your wife have a character? Uh, yes, her uh, steampunk character is uh, Lucretia Dearfour. And she's a steampunk chef. <laughs> so cool. I love that. Do you travel together a lot to different conventions? Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, 
I mean, granted, nowadays we don't travel much. <laughs> right, right, completely. Yeah. Uh, you know, and but for for several years, at, you know, we did the whole travel across the country at various steampunk and other science fiction conventions, and and that uh, was something that I didn't expect to happen when I first got involved. I was like, oh, we'll just go to like a local cons and it'll be fun. Um, but for a while, it, you know, it became a huge convention culture aspect. And there was a lot of people who were starting up their own conventions. And like many first time conventions, you know, not all of them last. Um, but it did give us reason to be invited to like speak and perform all across the country, which was pretty cool. That's so. cool. And I guess also to bring it back to your comment about uh, endowed objects. Um, so, and I, um, I'm assuming that like you've just read all of my stuff, which is like, oh, that's like, these are terms that like, I have not heard spoken aloud in a while. <laughs> I tend to really like latch onto certain like phrases. That's probably all. To, to, to the audience, let me just say, you should go to beyondvictoriana.com and Go check out the videos. That's where I found this phrase in one of her videos. So, Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, it was something that I was thinking about uh, specifically in how I do steampunk and why I choose like family objects. Because uh, some people like just, and it's fine. Like some people just do entirely new cosplays or like invent something of their own. Um, but in particular... I just thought it was really important to me personally um, to have outfits and, you know, not only inspired by my culture, but, um, you know, using things that belong to my family. Uh, and I, I wrote a little bit about it. There was an article that came out on tour.com, you know, a, called The Audi and I. Um, and it was my personal reflections about the importance of me using Vietnamese garments as part of my steampunk outfit. And particularly um, all the eyes I use, they were, you know, either, you know, they were from my mom um, or from my grandmother that, you know, they just ha it passed down to me. And I think um, what steampunks really value is uh, old objects and not just because they're old and they're cool looking, but the fact that they're resilient. And despite all of the wear and despite time, they still exist. And I also thought about how oftentimes it is actually a privilege to own old things and to have them. You know, there's the concept of old money, you know, versus new money. And what defines old money is that they have a lot of old objects. They have like the family heirlooms. They have the house that came down through generations, like all that sort of stuff. And for many marginalized communities in the United States, uh, the concept of having heirlooms, of, of having like old family objects, like, you know, is more difficult to attain and to keep. You know, of course, like for, for immigrants, uh, you know, and for families like mine, you know, who, you know, in my case, like they fled, you know, their homeland without anything on them. And so they left everything behind, um, you know, as is the case with a lot of people who have come here um, either as immigrants or political refugees. Um, you know, there's uh, also, you know, for those who have suffered from social oppression in the United States that just deliberately took away their heritage, like for the Native Americans and other indigenous communities, you know, their their home you know their homeland was taken away they were moved somewhere else their language was denied you know their all these things that they had was forcibly taken away uh, and of course you know for members of the black community whether you know they came as part of the transatlantic slave trade um, or elsewhere it was you know a deliberate theft of what they had and they had you know, and they had very limited means of even conceptualizing where, what could have happened to them, what could have happened to their histories and their families. And it was only through their own perseverance that they were able to build out their own culture in the United States. Um, so, you know, and, and of course, 
not to mention, you know, if your family suffered from generational poverty, you just couldn't afford to have things that lasted. You could afford to have boots that would last for six months or a coat that would last for one winter. So when I think about the concept of an endowed object, you know, I do think about it not only as a, what could be a symbol of very selective privilege, but also a symbol of aspirational hope that you could still hold on to something, even if it was lost or stolen or taken away from you. Yeah, so much meaning there. I just, I loved your description of that. Thank you. I'd also love uh, that you were talking about some of the things that you've written, your articles. And for anyone that has not gone to beyondvictoriana.com, the amount of stuff on Diana's site is so impressive. So definitely everyone needs to go check that out. Uh, But also for anyone who hasn't jumped in with those, uh, what can they expect? What is your goal with those articles and and what can they find there? Well, they can find a lot of indexes. (laughs) (laughs) You know, uh, use the tag system because after a certain certain point, it's always more convenient to just tag stuff of everything. Uh, You know, the, the, the archives go back to... 2010. So there is more than enough information for people to browse around, even if they're just curious about one thing or another. What I, you know, what I aimed to create when I founded Beyond Victoriana was just a space, a space for conversation. And, you know, one of the things that people have talked about when they talk about steampunk, they talk about it as being a part of a new imaginative reality of exploring the what ifs and why nots. And oftentimes I think that when people say like, oh, wouldn't this be really great to explore? Like that's the point of fantasy. And when they think about steampunk and its historical roots, they're like, oh, this is really great. We can explore all these possibilities of alternate history. Um, At the same time, you still get moments where people are locked into the cage of history and they think that, oh, you know, it's, it's only real alternate history and therefore it can be made more steampunk if we just go in this specific direction. And I'm like, really? Like, that's all? You know, this is why we have so many, just in general, in media, you know, retellings of what if the South won the Civil War? Like, come on, come on. What if the Nazis won World War II? I'm like, are you serious? Is that the only thing you, that really, really fascinates you <laughs> when you talk about the what ifs of history as opposed to everything else? Um, Diana, I'm glad you said it because <laughs> I've thought that many times, like with the vastness and the nuance of human history, even as limited as it is, like we know it hasn't been captured correctly. Right. But like, even with what we have, how are we coming up with the same things? Like there's so much nuance. Right. Exactly. And I think what makes history really fascinating is that it does contain so many layers that, you know, a person can't even conceptualize because there's always another story to be told. There's always a different perspective that had not been considered before. There's always knowledge that had been hidden away or forgotten or obscured. And steampunks are really nerds, essentially. Like they're nerdy about something, whether it's building stuff or researching stuff or reading stuff or making stuff. Um, you know, And it's just a very intellectually stimulating place to be in. Okay, Story Punks, I'm going to break for intermission here between the two episodes. This ends episode 61, and the interview does continue in episode 62. And isn't Diana just the best? I loved speaking with her, and I love looking at all the resources that we've already touched on. But there's so much more to come. So in the meantime, you may want to go check out beyondvictoriana.com and you will have no shortage of different things to check out over there and uh, also in the meantime if you will consider leaving a review for the show i look forward to rejoining you for the rest of this conversation and as ever best of luck with everything you are working on 